I'm Angela Gunder, and I'm Senior Instructional Designer at the University of Arizona. I'm Ben Scrag, and I am the prod Program Manager for College Ready Ohio, a K-12 higher ed consortium grant at The Ohio State University. And I'm Dave Goodrich. I'm a learning experience designer at Michigan State University. (laughs) All right. How's everybody doing? Doing Um, good. I love that we're recording and I'm still eating (laughs) Cheez-Its. Hey, as soon as as soon as I get the say so, it's let's play ball. You're like boom goes the dynamite. (laughs) Correct. Although what is entirely fair to say uh, is that I have not yet joined any kind of Zoom recording. So you know, I don't. Me... I don't think we need to join Zoom. Like this is no. freaking awesome that we can hear each other right through Zencaster. Like I was just talking to Angelo about how much I am loving Zencaster. This is blowing yeah. my mind. This thing is pretty slick. Theoretically, all three of us could could create separate podcasts out of yeah. this. Uh, I, of That's course, am going to so rearrange cool. all of Angela's words into being <laughs> horrific. Theoretically, uh, you won't have to work too hard. That's, this is uh, – I mean, I know this is basically. I'm I'm going to repurpose all of this for for my very very staunchly uh, pro Trump podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the most nefarious pursuit you could engage in. <laughs> Which I I know you all saw that coming, just based on how you know me. Uh, you I are, am. You, you are a Trumpster. I'm an ardent supporter, is what you would call me. <laughs> Uh, but as, but as a side note, as a side note, I should say that um, if this were a video podcast, you would see that I am drinking a margarita out of Boys. my notorious Big pub glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. Well, Just so you know how I live my life. <laughs> well, I I think I do, and I respect that. Uh, as a bird man would want us to do. Um, <laughs> if you were seeing me, you would, you would see that I'm alternating between sips of iced coffee and bourbon, which are also. Oh, nice. Me, uh, I'm drinking uh, Founders Dirty Bastard. Oh, see, there's. Touche. Two, two out of three rappers represented. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Old Russell Jones, RIP. Gone Russell, too soon, in my opinion. Rest in peace, big baby Jesus. <laughs> big baby Jesus, a.k.a. Osiris. Uh, AKA, gone. AKA Dirt McGirt. <laughs> Old dirt dog, <laughs> gone too soon. <laughs> this is. <laughs> did it, did it, did it. This is probably the best thing that we'll do this evening. <laughs> shimmy, shimmy, ya, yeah, shimmy, yeah, shimmy, yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man oh man my i'll tell you my, one of my favorite one of my favorite uh high school moments was uh baseball season Wu- wu-tang forever probably had just come out and for whatever reason i was i was really really hyped on the on the bus to a. <laughs> <laughs> to a dirty verse <laughs> and just let it go through my headphones to the point where the uh the JV coach had to tell you to simmer had, down had to had to come back and <laughs> tell me to lift the headphones and tell me to tell me to hold that down a little bit so what i, I think love the... about that story is you were on a loud bus yes <laughs> Yeah. I just love that the the coach was named as the JV coach. The attention to detail in this story <laughs> is as if it happened yesterday. Well, here's how I know that sort of thing, uh, and I'm calling him the JV coach because I, his his actual real name is escaping right now. He was the nicest guy, and I want to say it was oh maybe McCoy. He actually lived up the street from me, and I did a mentorship with him. He worked. <laughs> This is the late '90s in in Appalachian, Ohio, and there was one place uh, in the town nearby that did wide open MRIs. So it was not a confined MRI machine, although it was still quite cramped and terrifying. And he he worked as kind of a rep for this wide open MRI, and so I went and drove around with him while he was uh, he was the baseball coach, and so he was very nice about telling me that I. 
I, <laughs> you can't say those words that loud uh, while the softball team's also on the bus. Uh, <laughs> that was my. That, that was my dude. So, just my keep dude it whose real. name I don't remember. <laughs> He'll always be your dude. The yeah. dude abides. He'll always be the guy of the street who had the cool Mitsubishi. So, <laughs> <laughs> so why are the um, cultists here today? <laughs> yeah, what are we even doing? This is I want to hear Dave's, 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 Dave's podcast voice first and foremost. Oh, no, 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 no. That's my favorite. No, it's my favorite thing in the universe is is podcasty Dave mode. Podcast Dave. <laughs> PDD. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> no, what I want to hear sometime is m- more history on both of your career trajectories because that just sounds like a fun time. Uh, open. MRI. <laughs> I've never even heard of open MRIs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's really not that open. I mean, that's kind of the, it's, it's definitely a kind of a misnomer. Uh, it's a joke. It, it's a joke it's still, in the medical community. It still looked quite cramped. <laughs> um, <laughs> so an interesting thing happened last night, uh, that it, I still haven't even got back around to it and I'm, I'm still a little bit angry, but for whatever reason, just this week at work, has it, it turned into the maybe the busiest work week of my life yes and uh which is funny because when i left for <laughs> new orleans last week like everything was cool like stuff was like really good you thought and you then, were on top of your game well right well yeah so there's definitely there was the illusion of that uh but the the funniest <laughs> thing was like as we were in the innovation lab i started I, I was constantly kind of checking my emails. And I was like, oof, oof, ooh, I, these look like things I'm going to need to get back to. I and I do recall some of those moments, actually. Oh, man. <laughs> and then, and it was like, be here now. So, so we did this very interesting to me anyway, corporate training at Ohio State a couple of years ago. And everyone got these, these plastic kind of desk plaques that say be here now right and it was kind of like you know and it was all about managing your your energy and giving your best to situations so last week that was my mantra in the innovation lab while while the the waves started to kind of build uh from columbus and i was like "Ah, that's all right we're in the innovation lab we're in new orleans everything's great and then i just yeah i just went into the office this week it was uh it's been crazy but this thing happened last night which is um Wednesday nights in the state of Ohio are typically uh, OH Ed chat nights on Twitter, and oh, mostly yeah. those are those are K twelve chats um, or K twelve focus chats. A couple of guys in, in Central Ohio typically take the lead on those, and I love them. And last week they combined it with DT K twelve chat, which is design thinking in K twelve chat. And so the whole the whole Twitter chat was on design thinking, and it got real. Uh, meta. It got real, real. Well, meta. it's crazy because I I saw it yesterday in the day, and I was like, "Oh, this I'm going to kill this chat tonight. I'm going to be so involved." And then a a buddy, a very good buddy of mine, was like, "Hey, let's let's go grab a drink." And he and I do uh, the I Believe Foundation stuff with our kind of nonprofit with the kids, and so we went to talk about that because I hadn't seen him. And it just so happened that one of the principals that were, were trying to, to get some of their kids to get involved was on that chat. And so Patrick was like, oh, look at this kind of cool chat I'm on. And I was like, no, I was supposed to be dominating that chat. And so <laughs> when we finally jumped in, I was like scrambling furiously. But but normally, right, I have my tweet deck up. I'm like, I'm dominating uh, at life. And last night I had to try to do it off of my phone while – uh, Bob Dylan covers were, were playing loudly in a in a bar, oh, so it yes. didn't go well. I had so I'd, I've had such a similar week, and last night was the Michelle chat, also Wednesday nights. Yep, uh, yep. And and I was like in a in the same kind of situation. It was about computational thinking, and I was like, oh my word, I got to jump on that. And then I had a phone call with somebody at work, like at eight thirty, right in the middle of. Uh, the chat, which totally disrupted that flow that was going on, you know, and man, so it's hard guys, in these streets. 
Do you guys feel like you're going to have a moment where you are going to organically come back to that lightning in a bottle? Because both of you left on this adrenaline high and you went back to the real world, um, sort of like if we're going to talk about the hero's journey, you went off to the innovation lab, you found your solution, you have that magic elixir that you're going to take back to your um, fellow institutions, you're going to cure all the people of all that ails them but then you get there and some donkus is already there and they're (laughs) rocking it with an elixir that they found somewhere else so when is when is your moment going to come i just got back from summer camp basically is what happened and day one i have like 50 chores to do around the house that's kind of how i'm feeling Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so my thing, and it's been interesting, right? And I have this very, it's a lot like that, Dave. I think it's, it's funny. I came back from the week feeling so good about uh, two things. One about the relationship, just the relationships with you all. And just, you know, it's kind of like when we're in that zone, and there it is. Some of it has to be the context and the magic of a conference. But the other thing is just like, you know, I, I've been reading a lot about like the value of taking a sabbatical year and things like that. Right. But to me, a conference like that atmosphere where you're all together is like it's not even a sabbatical year. It's a sabbatical week and it recharges your batteries just to be in the presence of people who like-minded or not it's at least refreshing and so there's there is intellectual generosity and personal expression and that's really that's really super cool so yeah it was it's hard to go back to work and be like hey none of you saw how awesome i was last week right but (laughs) but you know that i'm awesome right or and the other piece is uh, i and i got i really got this enthusiasm Dave from from Jeff Grable, who was like, you know, we're doing oh, such yeah. incredible stuff at Michigan State. Rock I was like, hell yeah. yeah, I was like, hell you, hell yeah, you are. I want to be at Michigan State too, except for that, you know, I love being at Ohio State. And I just came back and I was and I was telling all of my 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 people, I'm like, guys, we're doing some of the coolest stuff, and we're not really telling anybody, and that's fine because it, it's not necessarily about that. I just want you to know I'm proud of you, and like I think we're doing awesome stuff. And it'd be cool to share it just to be in that community. Yeah. Yeah. I I had a similar conversation with my boss actually. And it was the same thing. Jeff and his call to action at that plenary panel. Um, Certainly he inspired me for what all of you guys are doing at Michigan state. But what I really loved was that, what he was saying about all of the stuff that was happening at MSU, it was the same as the things that I had seen um, you, Dave, doing yourself and, and just not and all of the awesome mm-hmm. work that she's doing. And mm-hmm. because all of you guys were present at the conference at the same time, it was less about you as individual thought leaders and more yes. about you as collaborators working as together a totally. as a team. And that's that yep. was so profound to me because we do come to conferences um, in isolation. We're sort of representative yep. of our universities, and I think a lot of that has to do with budget cuts, and that's a whole separate podcast that we oh, can yeah. kind yes. of tackle that piece about how can we um, mitigate that roadblock and get people oh, we'll, collaborating. We'll fix and- it. We'll fix yeah, it all. Well, I mean, that's what we do. We're fixers. You know, we go, we go in there and we blow shit up and then, um, and all is right with the world. But, right. um, it was a really profound message that, um, you know, he was up there on the plenary panel stage saying innovation does not happen alone. It happens in collaboration and we're all working together. And the proof was in the pudding when I looked around and I saw all of the folks that were there at OLC innovate that were representing, um, the university. University. And Ben, I feel the same way that you do, where I went back to my own people and was deeply affected by all of the awesome work that they're doing at UA. And I said, you know, we really need to do something similar where we're talking about our collaborative work rather than just sending an individual off to relay, um, the, you know, the message from one voice of, of all of the awesome things. It it needs to be a cacophony of voices because that's, that's how we work. That's how we do all of the, all of the magic things. Well, and, and I think this is, I, I really wrestled 
<laughs> I wrestled with this a lot while we were there, which is, um, and I, and I had this conversation this week with some of our people, which is, you know, our institution, Ohio state. And I think this is fair to say for Michigan state and Arizona too. It's like, these are big public state schools that are, you know, research institutions that are massive, have lots of moving parts. And in some ways are, are not necessarily representative of a lot of the kind of constituents and colleagues at an OLC conference. And, um, that's not necessarily that, that I'm painting with a pretty broad brush there, but, um, it is. It was fascinating to see presentation titles and, and content there from people who just don't have the the scale that we have, and for all the advantages or disadvantages it comes with. And so, I found a lot of value from networking, kind of just just with you all and hearing what you're doing. And it, again, it's. It, that's a fine line, right? Because it can sound obnoxious or pretentious to to assume that we're a great institution just because we're big or that, that the, that there's nothing to learn from other people. And that no, but we, have, what I'm saying. we have similar challenges and there's this moment yeah. where you feel like you don't have to translate, um, yeah. like you would. And I'll, I'll use the analogy of going to a lot of ed sessions that are for K-12. I yeah. have a lot to learn from the K-12 sphere and I always go in with an open mind. I, the, I think the best example of this was South by Southwest EDU this year. It was heavily skewed to K-12. So that meant that rather than say, you know what, this is not for me, I had to go in and figure out how the the latent message could be translated to higher ed and then to a certain extent to my institution. So there's this moment when you're with folks that have similar challenges that are specific to um, just being at a big research one institution. Um, yeah. You feel a little bit more comfortable, and you also feel like you've got a, a comrade in the trenches yep. because they're they're seeing it the way that you're seeing it. And of course, there's nuance in there, and um, yep. there's a little differentiation, but it it frees you up a little bit to come up with better solutions to these bigger problems. Well, and and I think I don't know, Dave. Does that resonate with you? Oh, totally, totally. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just thinking about. Um, the lab itself, the innovation lab. And I was telling our team as we were kind of reflecting uh, on Tuesday at a, a staff meeting about how exhausted I was at the end of each day. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mainly because I think uh, the, the things that are most valuable to me about a conference, those grassroots just kind of natural connections that are made between sessions with people and hearing people reflect about what they're learning about, what's most valuable to them. That was happening um, like the entire time during <laughs> the innovation. Without a lab. break. There was yeah, no we break never really, in that. We never really turned that off, did we? No. No. And you usually have those moments where you step away and you try to figure out what session you're going to go to next and you're, and you're waiting for the next session and that's when yeah. you collect your thoughts. And I, I mean, you guys remember there was, I think it was on maybe the, the second or the third day in the innovation lab, I had to go off and present and I had a moment where I felt a little bit manic. And what it actually was, was that I had been oversaturated with promising big ideas that I wanted to selfishly stay in the lab and continue to unpack. And bear in yeah. mind that every moment that we were in the lab, we were working, but while we were working, we were taking just as much as we were, as we were giving. And it was hard for me to switch totally. gears and say, okay, now I'm going back to the usual conference culture where I'm going to sit up at a panel and talk to, hmm. um, a, a group of folks that had gathered. And there was nothing wrong with that. It was just so foreign to me in that moment because we had done such a good job of creating this immersive experience that, um, issued the, the sit and get 
modality and really embraced the collective creation of knowledge. It, it was, um, it was a bit of culture shock for me. And I always use the language analogy and Ben, I'm going to latch onto something that you said earlier about how you, you felt so comfortable and at home being in the lab. Yeah. And then you went back to your institution and you were kind of telling people how awesome you were. It's honestly like being an expat (laughs) and you're going back to your home country and you're like, oh, these are my people. They speak my language. They understand my culture. I don't have to translate any of this. Um, We're all in sync and we're in sync in a really deep and resounding way. And then. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I cut you off. I just, yeah. I was about to literally, st- I just, as you were saying that the other thing I was going to say, and maybe the reason this week was so busy is I think it's also one of the more engaged week. Like I, t- today I had two meetings. I felt, re- I felt really good at my job today and really engaged in just literally the thing, the narratives I kind of, I'll, I'll say unpacked or maybe I created for myself or that I thought I was noticing. I, I never know if that becomes self-fulfilling prophecy or just it's what it's probably is, is a attention bias, right? I'm just tuned into the words I want to hear. So they're always on my radar, but it seemed like last week was so much about relationships, narrative, um, basically kind of, uh, helping faculty, especially for someone like me, right? I'm not faculty, right? I'm in a support role, helping them, kind of take the next steps or do more and and kind of just be a, be a benefit to them. And as opposed to someone who's kind of a a burden to them. And, and we're, um, had a meeting with a, a actually Spanish faculty and Japanese faculty today. And, and, uh, they have applied for and won grants and are going to present at our innovate conference in two weeks Hmm. and just kind of coaching them through the presentation and working with them. Like I just felt really good about the narrative I was creating for them, which it just, I think the last couple of years when I, when I came home from ET four online, right, there was a similar high, but then it felt like it dissolved. Like I, I didn't have any place to go put that channel, that energy into. I felt like mm-hmm. I didn't have an infrastructure. And and so I, I think there was a real kind of after that, a, a kind of a disappointment of like, hey, I love this conference. I just don't know what to do with, with my learning. And I feel like this week, every time I turn my head, it's like, oh, yeah, now I know what to do with this. Hmm. How about for you, Angela? Soul like, how, oh, did, how did how uh, did the free conference for for you compare to conferences in the past? I mean, I know we're all big OLC fans, um, but just in comparison, how how things are changing? What, how did it compare? Well, I, I will I will tackle that question from sort of the preparation for the conference itself, particularly the innovation lab, and then the after mm-hmm. sort of like that thirty thousand foot look at it, um, after having gone through it beforehand. And I said, I think I said this to both of you guys, there are not too many instances where I am creating something that is wholly new, uh, where I feel like I'm unsure as to how it's going to hit the mark. I usually, um, with a lot of preparation and, um, research feel like I, I can anticipate what the end result will be and I can plan for any sort of result that could come my way with this. I was not sure how it was all going to come together. And the first moment that I stepped into the, the lab before it was even open to folks, I saw something that had taken shape in a really exciting and energizing way. And not necessarily because of all the work that the three of us did, um, and all of the work that the many other people did that helped us put it together. Um, But really, it was all of the work that folks had done before. Um, Like Dave, you always say, standing on the shoulders of giants. And this was the perfect articulation of that. 
walking into that space. And over the course of the the conference, I saw that more and more and more to include the people that had really inspired the whole idea for the innovation lab, being in that space and interacting with it just furthered, um, furthered Mm. my, my sense of pride in all of the the collective work that had been done with all of this. Uh, Now reflecting, looking back and reflecting on what happened, there was one interesting snapshot. Snapshot. And when we were in the lab, and you can all see a lot of the the podcasts and the the video that we collected when we were in the lab, it, it was it, it was very focused on the the design thinking process, and we were in the trenches with people really doing a whole lot of information transfer. I think that there were a lot of people that had not they'd heard of design thinking, but maybe had not experienced it in the way that we had set it up with the lab stations where they had to interact with each of those pieces. So that was new to them. But what I thought was so fascinating was that you take this conference and it is born from uh, blended and from ET4OL put together, high, high tech conference. And I think that this was the first time that I had been in a space, and I'll use a term that Felice Banner always uses. She calls them exploratory installations. It was the first time that I'd been in a space like this where it was the perfect marriage of the technology. You had the digital going strong for sure, but the analog was there and present and so very active and people were engaged with it. And I found that to be incredibly refreshing. It was as if, Nobody was hindered or limited in their ideation. They had whatever tools they needed in front of them. And folks were using, you know, the digital and the analog tools seamlessly. They were effortlessly shifting between the two. And that was that was really inspiring to me because a lot of times we spend, oh my gosh, you know, days, weeks, months, years trying to make that happen in a meaningful Mm -hmm. and profound way. And it, and it was just there. It was present. We didn't, we didn't say, okay, and now is the time that you have to, you know, use this particular tech tool. We just had people that were free thinkers that were open to the experience, uh, collaborating and working with other folks. So I feel like it was resoundingly successful what we did, but, I'm already looking to what it'll be in the future. I mean, what, what are people going to leave with? What are, what is going to be the, the product or the deliverable that is born from this space that um, that we've helped to put together. And that's really fascinating because I think the big reflection, I, you know, I don't know if we want to do a formal debrief some other time or if this kind of is a stand in, but, um, you know, going into that last week, I focused so much on the tools and the processes and having all these materials there. So people would always have, you know, those, those kinds of, um, anyone who wanted to work on a challenge wouldn't feel stifled because there wasn't, they didn't have the, the tools they thought they needed or, or the, the intellectual firepower. And, and now that, I'm kind of reflecting on it. I think there's a really powerful role for some of those lab techs to just really be relationship builders and networkers for people who come in. Um, And I know there was a moment, and it must have been Thursday, where, and I don't even remember who said it, but we were kind of having this conversation. I feel like one of us said to another, like, hey, you know, don't feel like you need to be the coach, that you need to put this all on yourself and kind of walk people through the process. Um, And maybe that was real or imagined. But the more I think about it now coming out of it, I don't know if coach is the right word, right? So maybe that's not what we want to do. But, But just being there and engaging people and maybe not even focusing on the design thinking process and teaching process or being, hey, look at this process, but just just being a relational person who's there and just us having maybe a set of questions of like, hey, what are you what are you most passionate about in your work? Or you know, yeah. and just kind of start start um, imagineering right in, in that regard. I feel like that would be very. I feel like there would be an interesting role for us to do that in the future. I I definitely think this installation needs to continue. 
Yeah. Um, I think it was so much more social and so much better uh, than the technology test kitchen and, and no knock on that. It's just, you know, it's just an evolution of an idea. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, it's a, it is inherently a social process and so, so meaningful when you connect people to empathy. So, um, well, nah, I'm gonna, it's great. I'm going to, um, drop a little more of, um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey or the monomyth on you and say, if the, uh, folks that enter the space are the epic heroes that they're going to take part in a journey to find new knowledge or create knowledge, that the role of the lab tech is actually the wise elder um, within the monomyth, the person that sends the hero off on their journey with the tools that they need or the knowledge that they need in order to succeed. So that that person doesn't have the answer um, themselves, but they have the keys that will help to to, um, solve that puzzle. And I think that that's really the role that we played. We were just there to help contextualize. We were there to help reframe ideas. We were there to just encourage. Sometimes we were there just to listen, to literally stand there and, um, you know, be supportive as people worked out really complex challenges that were, um, on their radar at that moment. Like they, they left their universities or they left their institutions with those challenges right in front of them and were able to come up with some of those answers in that space. And all it meant was us just being physically present to, to be supportive and help out. I think that that's, that that's huge. Mm. Um, say it well, you did say it. Well, <laughs> yeah. well the other yes. really tri- trippy thing, and I think you guys would agree with this is that As we were helping people on their journey, they were helping us on our own. So we came in with our own big questions and um, we were um, certainly selfish in that we wanted to use that space to answer our questions. So I want to ask you guys, what were some of the big questions that you came in to the innovation lab with that you were hoping to answer and what were some of your findings? Dave, I'll defer to you on that. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I think for me, um, I was really curious to see how kind of the volunteer um, model was going to work out. And I was completely refreshed and excited the whole time by even people like Ryan, uh, who I had never met before and he came and just like, you, you just saw him like <laughs> just, uh, he had never been in an OLC conference before either. And just, just to watch him connect with our crew and find that community and fit and, right like, into the whole right process in and contribute and share his own experiences. And th- that was just awesome. And I want to see more of that. Um, there's, there's lots of things I, I've, I learned last week, um, and lots of things like personally that I want to do different and learned, but, um, one thing is definitely to, uh, kind of encourage more volunteerism to the point of like, uh, even, even volunteers just giving a little bit of their time versus feeling like they have to be there the whole time so that mm-hmm. even more volunteers can participate. Um, yeah. Cause I just think that was, I don't know. I want, I want to talk with Ryan. I want to talk with, um, the others who participated Steve. too and get their feedback. Yeah. Steve. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's one thing that I, I think I would see for the future is leveraging, leveraging the digital space as much or sorry more um maybe beforehand and part of this right was i and and i i will confess like this is i i see it so much more clearly now right once you've experienced it and i think Mm -hmm. even going in you know as of two weeks ago it was like hey start sending some tweets under this hashtag and it's just kind of like that's cool. I just don't know what it's, I, you know, you never know until I don't know if you never know, but I didn't know until I was in there. Amen. Um, 
<laughs> and so, so, so it's kind of one of those things where I can see like, um, being able to leverage social, social volunteerism to say, Hey, come, come mm-hmm. by. Will you, will you just kind of navigate in the space? I think the other thing is to get, and, and I saw the Keegan, uh, from, from Oklahoma kind of had, uh, kind of the list of people who were the most active on Twitter using the OLC innovate hashtag. Oh, yeah. And I think it'd be, it'd be great to pull some of those people who are really active in that space, um, to be kind of one of those places where it's like, Hey, come just come network with people who are really active in this community. And even if you just pick their brain, um, and I, I that's why I find myself being influenced by, so many peers at, at the conference. And then, you know, Jess asked a really great question in her session and your session too, Angela, um, you know, about how do we continue to leverage what has been started here and how do we support each other? And I feel like, you know, so much of this, we're all apart more than we're together. And so the way we continue to build these relationships through, those digitally networked spaces, I think is, is huge. So then can you take advantage of those and make those work for you at the conference? Well, I would say that, um, and Ben, you and I talk a whole lot about reframing challenges as opportunities. I would say that we should reframe, reframe that term apart more than together. Yeah. Yes. As we are, um, we are connected digitally more than we're connected in the same physical space. Spatially. Yeah. Yeah. So knowing that, how are we going to capitalize on right. the very tangible high that we feel when we're in the physical space? I mean, to the point that we're, you know, we're giddy about mm-hmm. not only our connections, but the connections with people that we have not yet met yep. that, that we're going to meet anew um, within this area. Uh, using that same language that we've used a whole lot of, we have a tribe, um, you know, Joyce uh, Seitzinger, has uh, her group, the academic tribe. And I just love that uh, yep. term because you, you know it, you feel it. And I, I don't think that we have to wait until we're um, breathing the same air to tackle some of these bigger challenges. I think that we can continue to do these things and work together in really meaningful ways throughout the year. And maybe that physical space becomes the time that we celebrate the wins. So we, we persist and we struggle and we question and we, we test and we tinker and we do it even though we're um, thousands of miles away. And then when we get together, that's when we actually share, um, the fruits of our, of our labor. Mm. Preach. <laughs> what? What I, really want to do, I really just want to go church and drop the mic. So. <laughs> it's a shame. Uh, I don't care about any of this at all. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, so, it's a shame right. I'm so, un, I'm so uh, <laughs> you know, un- uninvested in any of this, <laughs> but that's, I don't know, you know, but you, you <laughs> I really, you know, it's powerful just when you stay in the realm of, of possibility, right? So I'll tell you that my, I've been working through this kind of, um, I won't call it a statement of principles. Well, maybe it's something like that, but I, I will take, I'll tell you another story that is obviously a tangent off a tangent. But when I was the last class I took as an undergrad, uh, I was student teaching, but I actually, uh, came back at night and took one class and it was with a professor at Ohio university. His name was Najee Muhammad. He, he passed away a couple of years ago, cancer, um, best professor I've ever had to this day of my life, but he challenged students in a way I'd never I'd never seen a professor challenge anyone in undergrad. Never. I, I don't even think I'd ever really been challenge, challenge to think. And this guy, one of the very first assignments we had to do was anchors of our, of our identity. And so you had to essentially write an autobiography, but it was, it had to be tied to 
you know, what are the things that anchor who you are? And so I've, I've just, I've always kind of kept that every once in a while as a, as a kind of a personal check-in. I like to work through who, what am I about and what do I do? And I, I've been thinking about that obviously on the plane, on the, on the way home, I started, re, you know, reworking those again. And one of the big ones is around obviously education and the power of it, but being optimistic about the future is always like that hits a lot of buttons for me. Like I think leadership, the kind of the phenomenon of leadership or at its core leadership is about, you know, driving toward a future that hasn't happened yet, that we are, that we have some locus of control over or influence over and kind of what marks us as human beings, right, is our ability to look, <laughs> think futuristically and say, I want that to happen. And then either through skill or luck or relationships kind of will things to happen. And that some of that sounds very grandiose, but like tomorrow, I think I might have pizza for lunch. And like, <laughs> so just this idea, right? And but, but leadership to me is always kind of one of those things of like, hey, there's this thing that hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen that kind of leadership is challenging whatever the default future is. Right. And so coming out of this conference and these kinds of relationships that we have, and that, and that's what I see and hear when you talk Angela about your passion for this, right. Or, or what, why are we doing any of this? Maybe an education period it was because we believe that some of this stuff is possible. And like, I don't know, it's easy to not feel that way when I'm just like slogging through, my outlook inbox, but it becomes <laughs> so much easier when it's like, all right, I'm going to go into this meeting. Uh, I have this standing meeting every week. How can I reframe this? So I'm not just walking in and just, you know, quietly checking my email <laughs> while someone else is talking instead of engaging in this. What, what if I treated like, you know, this is an opportunity to leverage toward whatever futures I kind of want to create. And so there's something about coming out of this conference with the energy to stay connected with you all and to keep driving in the future that I do think has made me feel more engaged this week in the things I might have otherwise overlooked. And like that was a benefit coming out of last week. I did not anticipate. Profound <laughs> and true. I mean, that's that's from the heart. And yep. I, I think that's a sentiment that's echoed by, by many, many folks that um, were there in the lab. I think it's also a, a surprise to a lot of the folks that were brand new to the conference and were certainly brand new to that space that, that didn't know that, um, that those ripples would still be felt a week later. I, yeah. I would venture to guess even longer than that. Those seeds yeah, were planted, man. Guys, but I feel like there's so many things um, just from the experience last week that I can take with me, especially yeah. our the design thinking uh, four step thing that kind of emerged from yes. our conversations. There's so many, so much of that that I can directly apply to so many different contexts of different projects or groups I'm working with. Like that, I feel like I can pull all of that and repurpose it and remix it for I have a question for amazing. you guys for you guys too that that's related to that Dave with our with our four step design thinking consolidation if you will yeah. um, and this this was one that got me I mean this is something that I would want to do a lab on I would want to go to our lab manual on Google Drive and fill it out but um, I'm going to pose this to you guys we, we collectively as instructional designers, we chuckle when, um, folks say, Oh, I use the Addy model as my, <laughs> and I, and I don't adapt it and I don't change it at all. That's, that's mm -hmm. the instructional model that I, the, my design model that I use. And then I, and that's that. How could we take that distillation of the design thinking process and use that as our instructional design methodology and do it in a me it's, I mean, it, it, because that's what we're doing every day, correct? We're, 
um, we're, we're doing all, we're following all of those different steps. And I think that we do it. Um, yeah, we do it subconsciously, but how can we be intentional about it? Because that was, that was, you know, Ben, you were listing all the words that came up, Mm -hmm. um, and narratives for sure was, was one of them. But I think intentionality was another one saying that, that in this moment we're, we're actively trying to do this. And, and also in this moment, we're trying to give our students autonomy and agency to make them feel that they can express that same intentionality in their own yeah. work. That's what, that's the lighting in the bottle that we're trying well, to get. So how do we be intentional right. about our design process using the same principles that we're espousing? So I will just share that. It's been a slow building hunch, and I'm slowly building more and more connections every day. Um, I feel like sometimes I'm I. It's easy for me to talk lots of game um, because ideas <laughs> fasc, fascinate me, um, and this is one of those times where here's what I'll say. I'm a little, I'm a little nervous about letting the cat out of the bag about some big plan I have, because again, at a big institution where it's hard to just will things to happen all for all the talk about leadership, it is possible. It's just very hard to do it by yourself. And in fact, that's not mm-hmm. the point at a place like Ohio state, but I will tell you that within instructional design or the work we do with students and faculty, I'm I am so fascinated by the idea of design thinking because it just gives it gives a name and a methodology to a lot of what I again when I'm thinking through those anchors a lot of what was so revelatory is like this design thinking stuff is just you can call it the scientific method you can call it heuristic you can call it the best we're capable of it's just it's how do we go actually will something to be in an empathetic creative way using those around us and the, and, and just, you know, a link in a chain, a step at a time to make something better. And so I, I've become like this huge, huge believer in design thinking without having produced much through it, if that sounds strange, maybe, but so I, I think not at all. So, so it's kind of become in some ways, my, the compass for, for, how I want to pour myself into my work, no matter what it is. So I guess what I'd say is, and, and so people around me are definitely catching wind that this gospel is kind of brewing and within me. But I, I guess to answer the question, I kind of want to wait (laughs) and, and produce some stuff with it uh, before I start talking about some big design thinking plan to take the, the world over at Ohio state. But it's. I, I how feel about you, Dave? Very similar. Like it's. Uh, I, I like how you described it as uh, a new articulation, uh, a reframing of what it is we already do. And truly, I mean, you can you could make connections also to Addy <laughs> through design thinking. But for there's sure, there's something about design th- thinking and the 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 concepts that are coming from it that. The, the big ones that really stand out are the embracing of failure, um, yeah. iteration, and um, really starting from a point of empathy, empathy and and dreaming really big, like moonshot dreams. Because I mean, you you can go through the, the Addy process and come out with some pretty crappy stuff, but <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> well, and but, the, and I mean, I. Uh, sorry, Dave. I, I, oh, it's maybe good. it's. I guess here's the question: Is what you're saying with that is, I I think the problem. Well, a, a thing I've heard people say, and so I'll just piggyback on it. But I also kind of I believe it too, which is the a problem with a process like Addy. Right? Is a lot of people tend to put that process in in front of the idea that they're actually humans working the process mm-hmm. right so it yes. it takes this very mechanical or rote picture of something that's incredibly complex and and difficult and mm-hmm. and i will argue shortly um tragic like education um in in like the dramatic tragic sense of 
you know, you, you actually don't know if what you're doing is the right thing because the ends sometimes don't reveal themselves for a student until years later. Right. So you, 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 it's tragic in that you think you're doing what's best, but you might not know. And, and Bonnie Stewart says, you know, I hate the term best practices because when you're talking about complex cognitive work, how, how can you possibly presume to know what the best practices are. So I think there's something fascinating about that idea, right? That, that a process is fine, but when you put it in front of, when it precedes humanity, Mm. right? Um, now you're in an existential problem. Mm. Another drop the mic moment. (laughs) So, We've been we've been at it for a little while talking about all of the positives and the um, the epic wins and the um, moonshot vision for the future. What would you say some of the lessons learned and um, I purposefully say opportunities for change um, that, that you think are in front of us based on the way that the innovation lab was designed and how it went? Well, I think you and I uh, connected. We we got the sense um, that, and I think this is such a common, one of my favorite uh, quotes about design is, um, design isn't about all the things you put into something. It's it's about knowing what to take away. And that to me is really profound because um, it, it truly is a lot of work on, on knowing what is the the essence of something and i think that you know as instructional designers sometimes i describe us as professional planners on steroids um we <laughs> we like I, to project have managers. our shit together right yeah totally and um i think uh we needed a little more space actually um between our actual sessions for reflection and such i think i think um, just the fact of our fatigue at the end of the day, I think that um, there there needed to be more space for just reflection and connection, um, mm. par- partially yeah. because those things were happening during the sessions, too. And, and I think the space layout was just so brilliantly designed, primarily, I think... Uh, by you, big, Angela. Big prop. Like, no, no, no. Big props to Christine Hinckley and Katie yeah. Five Schuster for taking yep. what was a friggin' Google slide diagram <laughs> yep. <laughs> that some drunk people put together <laughs> <laughs> and making it into the Disney world of, of constructivist uh, creation and education. I just loved the, the, the informal and formal uh, merging by that spatial design itself for the yeah. for that learning space, like that itself is blowing my mind and making me think of like learning space design. Like, how can you uh, meld together informal and formal learning spaces? And I that best the best the best the best example of that I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I the the space. No, there's something in there about the 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 opportunity to reflect, and I think I found myself, especially late in the day, Thursday, and then Friday morning, feeling kind of really reflective and looking a little bit more inward, and and maybe that's just a natural response to having been. S- so socially focused, right. Or energized to get down there and and, and interact. (laughs) Yeah. But it, there was a, you know, especially with, I got through to prototyping and storyboarding an idea that I, I'd brought with me. And then it was Felice gave me some really good insight. Um, had a really interesting talk with Stephen and, and Frank and then uh, some of the folks from Alaska Fairbanks uh, just thinking about their session and the implications of it, especially the, the site fellows. Do you all remember their session? It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and faculty development. And it, it just kind of got me thinking, how, do, how can I take a message back that 
is pushing people to be the, the, their, their best, their best selves. And maybe that sounds flowery or like Tony Robbins ish, but like, <laughs> how do you go leverage? Like we have incredible, brilliant, smart people and, and a lot of universities do. Right. But you feel at home in your university. Right. So you, you love those brilliant, smart people cause they're your people. And it's like, how, I think a lot of times, at least at Ohio State, the, the message was it's been <laughs> – sometimes these people we, – we can look at them like they're the hard ones to work with or they're in control. And so if they just listen to what we wanted to do – and it was just this really interesting opportunity to say, no, huh, maybe we can reframe that. Maybe I can do some reflection and the space really – it lent itself to that. And I think even next year, if they're within that, that space, there's, there's even opportunities to go reflect privately, but stay in the space. That might be really cool. So one of our, um, lab techs, Frank Tomsick said that he envisioned the evolution of the technology test kitchen. And he was one of the, the two that really, um, made that idea reality. Um, he wanted to know if the test kitchen could have these different types of spaces that people could move through. And he, um, had talked about there being a station for pedagogical inquiry. And he talked about there being a station for just pure technology gadget saturation. And I wonder if within that same microcosm that he's trying to create within the exploratory installation, that there could be a mindful space for reflection mm-hmm. that people could just go and have a moment because we all need that. That's when the light bulb goes off. That's when, that's when we figure it all out. And, um, it's, it's a transformative experience having that moment of reflection that, that brings us to what we've been working so hard to find. Oh my word. That, that totally, uh, just jogged like an idea for next year in my mind, because, you know, you talk, you, you, you learn about all these scientists and these brilliant uh, inventors and how a lot of their best thinking they've described as happening while walking and talking with somebody. We should totally have like a, a lap, like a track around. <laughs> just like, I love this idea so much. <laughs> Yeah. Walk and talk. Well, even, you know, how they had the, so next to the innovation lab was the innovation installation and they had scheduled museum guide times. What if there was a scheduled walkabout time Yep. and people could even be paired up based on common interests and, um, and things that they're jazzed by. I mean, it could even be, um, a a lap based on one of the, the conference tracks or themes that you go and you do an informal chat with some people that are really, really energized by that same theme. Mm -hmm. And maybe one person, um, designates themselves and maybe they don't even reveal themselves that, Mm -hmm. that they're the, that they're the, the informal guide, but they come with a big question and you take that lap and you take that walk Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to unpack it. That's good. Well, yeah. And we got the river walk. <laughs> there we go. We Just, do. Right. Just right there. Now that's we, ha- we that's have the awesome. trip the trip down Bourbon Street. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm really proud of you guys and just proud to be a part of this whole thing because I don't know about you, but I've been at a lot of conferences where I hear a lot of complaining about, Oh, here we are just sit and get again. And I'm hearing someone talking about active learning to me, lecturing about it. And I'm so excited that we were a part of something that was just like, okay, well, let's just, let's do it. Let's do active learning. Let's do let's some of a space for it. And I was so surprised. Well, so, so excited about the, the people who signed up to run these sessions and how well they did at actually, it was like, they were just, they've just been waiting for the space and the permission to do it, you know, almost like they were waiting for their tribe to appear. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm just reveling in that. Um, <laughs> well, I, I so I think 
<laughs> someone's going to have fun editing this uh, and and formatting it, Dave. But so, I, I, someone, I might <laughs> someone, the only one. <laughs> uh, but I um, but I would be curious, and I think maybe. Maybe I, I, I'm working under the assumption this is not the last one of these we do. And I'm also working under the reality that there's a baby downstairs I need to go <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, tend to um, or at least uh, tag in to tend to. Um, but I'm interested I think- in I, I'm interested in so sorry, just the last thing I'll say is I'm interested in, you know, where we started with some of this conversation was how this has stayed alive for us. Mm -hmm. And for me, there's been a very real experience of coming back from, from the high of this, but not having any infrastructure, not being plugged in to the same kind of community and feeling a little despondent that it's, that it's actually just not real, that it was all just the magic of the, of the context of being away and being in a different context with, with different people. And yet, Angela, you're right. We're, it's not separation, right? By distance. Um, the collaboration, the opportunities are still here. And while we have work to do with our own teams and our yeah. own institutions, let's keep this going there. there there's an ethos yes. that I think that, I mean, you look around at a lot of digital communities that I hover around, right. That I really respect. So what Jesse and Sean and some of the, you know, Jess and folks who really engage with, hybrid pedagogy and the digital pedagogy lab, right? That's, I, I'm kind of on the fringes maybe of full participation in that community. And yet yeah. I really respect the work they're doing because they, they embody that. And I think, feel like that's us as well. I feel like there's, there's opportunity to leverage that same with the, the W3 EDU uh, podcast from, from last night. Right. So, yeah, totally. um, there's so, there's so, and, and this community is getting, I mean, even if there are maybe subgroups, I still feel like it's all the same tribe yeah. of, or, or kind of people, right? And so I think let's keep this going. Yes. So here's what I propose, and then I will release you on your own. <laughs> I was going to say recognizance, but <laughs> that's not really accurate in this, in this case. Um, what I propose is that the innovation lab cast become a thing. It's not based on a space or a time that it keeps on living. And um, we all went into the lab with challenges that we wanted to solve. And we only had so much time to do it, but I think we can extend that time. And this space, um, this recording becomes the way that um, we collaboratively, hopefully a little bit more drunkenly next time, but that's just me positing that you guys can handle it however you see fit. Um, but no, we, we come in here going. and we got to keep it going. I mean, and maybe we tackle a, a, a different, uh, challenge yeah. every time we come together and use our own process that use our, our distilled design thinking process that we created in order to, to unpack bigger ideas and then, um, share how well it's going in our own institutions and bring yes. in a lot of those thought leaders that are such rock stars that, yes. um, that we don't get to hang out with, but once or twice a year in the same fiscal space, but that inspire us on the regular and, and help us, uh, to keep up the momentum so that, you know, when we, when we have to struggle through just the, just the amount of work that we have yep. in front of us, that we still yep. continue to be energized and inspired. Yep. And that's, I think that's the reality, right? Is so, you know, we have our home, we have our institutions and that's where, you know, that's where we're doing our good work. But, but there was kind of a a paradigm shift that, you know what, maybe, maybe it's that there is full-time inclusion in this other community, even if it's the, you know, the physical presence doesn't exist, that maybe this is not, oh, these are my conference friends. I'll put them in this box and I won't see them that maybe there are real opportunities to go do good stuff together, even, even in separate missions. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited by that. And that, that makes all of this talk, right. Of what the, what the technology and what the digital kind of network space 
makes possible. It just makes it feel that much more real to live through that. So it's cool. It's something concrete. Yeah. Guys, you are the best. We got to do this again. I um, concur. And I so will be sharing this. Yes. So it shall amen. be done. Church. <laughs> <laughs> Let the congregation say amen. So shall right. it be. All, all right. right, kids. Thanks, guys. Have all right. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.